Welcome to My View from the Piano Bench. We do this on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Typically 7 p.m. Sometimes it flexes. Let's count on 7 p.m. this week. We'll make it on my Joe Holtz Notes YouTube channel. In addition to um, Piano for My Friends on Thursday evenings. It's been going on for a long time and I'm glad that we can keep it going. Thank you to all of you who support and encourage me via the links you'll find on the support page of my website, allowing me to keep it going and in effect sponsoring these videos. And if you watch with any regularity, uh, I should take a look and, and consider uh, a little, little nudge in my direction and regular support such as the Patreon tip jar option will elicit from me a thank you email each month with exclusive content. So on Wednesday nights, I'm kind of bringing you inside my world and not so much playing, which is why I moved the camera a little closer. Probably could have gotten it even closer. Camera meaning phone and less uh, important to show the keys. And we'll see if I can maintain some mental and verbal clarity here. So I'll be completely upfront with you. You're watching this on Wednesday evening. I'm recording this on, well, I was going to say Tuesday evening, but technically it's Wednesday morning. And I'm doing this on purpose. It's actually a little after midnight, Wednesday morning. So I thought about the topic that I wanted to use this week. And it's kind of timely. I should be able to just go with it and hopefully be interesting. And you'll notice the title of the topic is Post Game Show or The Post Game Show, whenever I decide to do. And the Post Game Show is a name I gave to the procedure that was very reliable, scientifically verifiable, because it was repeatable over and over again of a particular band leader that I was working for who would make a phone call to me on the way home from the gig and we would talk over all the details of the gig uh, all the interesting things all the you know just all the stuff and because those experiences that we have as musicians are you know fodder for great conversation so it wasn't just a, like an, a, an analysis session or a, a meeting you know it was conversation that the gig uh provoked and so i had my gig at stanford grill tonight in columbia and i'll talk about that a little bit it's it's a gig you know it's not you know a high profile fancy gig it's it's a grinded out gig and it's a part of what we do and I had a little extra caffeine on purpose on the way home tonight, thinking I would do this as opposed to record something else that I kind of had in mind tomorrow morning. And let's see how I do. I still might wind up recording that thing tomorrow morning if I can't pull this off. But so far I haven't fallen on my face, but I'm only a couple of minutes in. Oh my. <laughs> so uh, on Tuesday nights as... Uh, many of you know, I have the opportunity to join in with a, a long-standing gig tradition. Tradition? Yeah, long-standing gig arrangement of a uh, restaurant, shall I say chain, upscale, there's three of them, I believe, with uh, live jazz trios most of the nights of the week. In the restaurant that I'm in right now, they have moved it up to, to seven nights a week. Uh, I am not really in the geographical uh, area as much as most of the people who work that gig are. This is over in the Baltimore-Washington corridor, and I'm on the eastern shore of Maryland. So it's 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 a bit of a hike. But the, uh, the gentleman who arranges all of this and books the schedule and maintains it all, uh, he's been talking to me for a long time about getting me over there. And when they expanded, he offered me Tuesday nights. And it's really wonderful to do. Uh, from a strictly business point of view, 
I won't say questionable. It's okay one, one night a week. But if it were the kind of thing I was doing four or five nights a week and that was my, my main thing, uh, might not be the best thing primarily because of the distance and, and, and the time. Because it burns most of the day uh, to be able to do. And in my case, a three-hour gig uh, from six to nine. The weekends are six to ten. But I get to typically, although not tonight, play with uh, two wonderful friends and great musicians, Amy Shook and Scott Silbert, which the three of us are three quarters of the Schobert Shires. The other is Steve Apshire, and I wound up playing with him tonight. So first off, the, the nature of this gig, and this is a, a, a category of, of gig, and I suspect that in the past, when the music business was different, there was a lot more of this. Of course there was, because uh, there was a lot more of everything in the music business. But it still exists, where you have uh, a steady ongoing thing. Like back in the day, having music multiple nights a week at clubs and restaurants and stuff was just the norm. Now it's the exception. Uh, but seven nights a week at Stanford Grill in Columbia. And everybody has their night. And some people have multiple nights, uh, which wouldn't work for me, but that's okay. I don't have that. It wouldn't work for me all the time. You know, uh, if I'm taking a long drive one direction one day, another direction another day, another direction another day, that's a lot easier <laughs> than three long drives the same direction three days in a row. Yeah, and that's actually... Kind of in my last few days, different directions, which is cool. So you have your steady thing, and then it's not about you. It's about the contribution you're making to the larger thing, like the ambiance or, or whatever. And if you can't be there, you put in a sub who can hold it down for you. And because it's Tuesday, Tuesday night's the one night of the week that I typically... Well, so far, I have not had to sub out. Uh, and any other night of the week, it, it'd be a different story. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. Uh, sure Jazz, who I play with down in the Lewis Rehoboth area, had a situation like that with a steady Saturday night for maybe a couple of years, maybe even more. It, it went on for a good long while. And any one of us could sub it out. And it, it, was, it was a restaurant that was struggling. But the owner really, he got it, you know. But I think, especially toward the end, the only night of the week he made money was Saturday night. And it was really cool because, you know, the, the place was just like a little, almost a little jazz club-ish, like like you'd find in some city. But here it was, or like D.C., a lot of the people who go down Lewis or Hoboth are uh, D.C. people. And, yeah, but where I am... On Tuesday nights, I'm right in the middle of that, not D.C., closer to Baltimore, but in between Baltimore and D.C., that whole part of what they call megalopolis. So I am there on Tuesday nights, and I get to I get to just really bask in the rapport with these musicians and all the musicians I play with. So... Uh, so what I'm going to just keep doing is rambling on about the gig. It's just things that stick out. But I'm probably going to talk about other gigs this weekend. Because uh, it's not the weekend, technically. It's Tuesday. But, you know, when you're a musician, you kind of, you know, it's not a weekend or a week. There's just, what day is it well, on the calendar? Where am I supposed to be? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's Tuesday. It's not the weekend. But it's kind of like the end of the weekend. I have no idea. Uh, so, so I'm just going to keep keep going on now. So about the uh, the opportunity to play with the rhythm section uh, all the time. My circumstance is really different than it was uh, years ago. Not too many years ago. And a lot of years ago. For a long time, I would go... Weeks, if not months, sometimes, never never working with a bass player, never playing with a full rhythm section, playing solo a lot. And if I had a rhythm section gig, 
it would be typically with Mike McShane, and I'd be running left hand bass uh, drum. So I just never had the normal combo thing, uh, and that's changing. Of course, I'm my network has evolved. I'm doing different things. I'm back with the Madiris, which sometimes is a baseless, not baseless like no found, you know, foundationless. Although I guess it would be. But a no bass player trio is what I mean. Not like pointless. <laughs> Hopefully not. You know. Uh, but with their band, we're, we're doing a big band gig next month. That's going to be a blast. And uh, gigs with other people, like with, with Sharon at the Blossom Theory Project. Had a wonderful gig, wonderful show Friday night. The great bass player, Tom Baldwin. Uh, and you know, it gives me the laboratory to kind of hone my, and I'm re realizing now, or just kind of going harder down the road of a more unique approach to left-hand comping, uh, which is mostly just like leading tones and stuff. But it, it's cool. So I get to work out, you know, and I get to work out in a different way than I would get to work out before. So that is super cool. Uh, so about tonight's gig. That's what I'm going to talk about. How exciting is that? Well, every gig is exciting. <laughs> I'll tell you what wasn't exciting. Uh, the state of the piano. Oh, my goodness. Well, you have this nice grand piano. I think it's a Yamaha. And it is played every night of the week. And we are in that season of the year that just wreaks havoc. It's twice a year, spring and fall, when the climate changes, the humidity and all of that. Uh, and sometimes the piano is just not going to stay in tune, especially when it's being played that much. And that piano in particular, in that circumstance, where it's kind of on an outside wall, it's a windowed wall. We had something a few weeks ago where we had a real, I think a real, real dry, super cold day, and then it got humid the next day or something, and the piano was just impossible. I think the tuner comes in once a week, more than once a week, twice a week. Huh. Uh, but when it goes out, man, it, it, it goes out. And it had gone out tonight, and it would have been easier to play with an out-of-tune piano uh, solo for me. Uh, and I did that at home a long time. This piano is actually going out now. Let me play a little bit. I'm slightly fuzzy. Not horrible, but it's going out. And I'm going to record piano for my friends on this piano tomorrow. And it's going to be tuned Thursday morning. Uh, but that one time it was out, it was, it was a, oh, I would say it's unplayable, but it had to be played. <laughs> and we weren't quite that bad tonight, but bad enough and because I'm not just playing solo and I can kind of ignore it which I'm capable of doing you're playing with other people and you're not in tune with them and you, 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 it's sort of like a the grating thing grating uh, nails on a chalkboard and 
you know, you kind of hold back from playing. And you, it, it, I was not getting in a, a zone at all. There were several reasons for it. I think that was one of them. Uh, but they, but there were other factors. Uh, I kind of have to manage how I use caffeine uh, or what my sleep is like and how I accommodate that. You know, because when I'm playing, there are a lot of musicians who is just... You know, it's a procedure that they, they go through. It's a skill set. It's a, uh, you know, craft. It, it, and of course, it, it is all that. But, but for me, it also needs to be coupled with being emotionally there. It's not a cerebral experience for me. And if I make it that, I really limit what I, what I can do. So I was not satisfied tonight. But... Nobody got hurt, and I don't know that anybody else was dissatisfied, and that's fine. So let me just bounce now to what I did Saturday night. Uh, let's skip it a little bit and go back there. So I really didn't have a gig. I performed briefly uh, as part of a dedication of the new Cultural Alliance slash Arts Council building for the county. Uh, we have a very uh, active, uh, amazing arts community in this very rural area. And the economic engine of Chestertown is the arts, you know, and all the people who support it, which is a lot of people. And, uh, so typically, I wouldn't do something like that. I couldn't do something like that in a Saturday night because I'm not gigging someplace. But one of our uh, local local singers, fine singer, uh, I'm going to have her at the mainstay this summer, by the way. I won't mention her name at, at, at this point. Uh, and she, uh, she was asked to sing for this dedication uh, event. Other performers were asked as well. And who would you like to accompany you? Joe Holt. So I was called and this, you know, I looked at my calendar and I was Owen at the time. I'm going to call for other things like further out where that Saturday, I know I'm going to get booked for something. And it's like, you know, I really can't justify not working, you know, got to pay my bills. You know? uh, but this is like, yeah, I can do this. And I, I even went over and did, did a rehearsal. And we had a bit of a train wreck for our little six, seven minute kind of medley. <laughs> uh, and it was, just one, it was just one of those things where I don't know uh, how it happened, but for the second tune, she started singing something that we hadn't talked about. She's looking at me like, are you setting this up in my key? This doesn't seem right. And I'm like, yeah, this is correct. And then she starts singing something else. It's like, uh-oh, I don't know what's going on here, but I need to find my way. And as I said to her later, that you threw me a curveball and I dropped it. Right? And then she also recognized later, like, I wasn't supposed to sing that. I don't know what happened. <laughs> so we never really recovered from it. And, you know, she wouldn't agree with this, but I would say... You know, it's my job as the accompanist to make that seamless, to make that work. Now, I didn't see it coming, and I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't get it done. Uh, to the point where uh, we got partly in the tune. It was a simple tune, but I just was like, in the confusion of the moment, I lost my place in the tune. I had this little open area where I just like fumbled around I have that hasn't happened to me on stage for a long time I mean I recovered pretty quick but it was just like I obviously like was the waiter who tripped and fell and you know everything fell off the tray and some of the so some of the uh dishware broke you know and then real quick I got up and you know uh, kept going <laughs> okay maybe I'm overstating it a little bit but maybe not you know it's because you know this this is what, what I need to get done uh, and it was a, it was it was a frustrating moment 
Um, and then I got the uh, mm, feedback afterward from a musician friend. Uh, no, in intermission, I went out in the audience. He says, oh, nobody noticed that. Of course, you know, a few people notice it. And people, 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 I hate hearing that. It was just not the point. It's like, hey, we can fool people. No. No. We, we want to... We we want to be in control of what we're doing, and and if we we have our ducks in a row, and the outcome is less than perfect, that's okay. You know, if we screw up all our ducks, but somehow we have a really good outcome, that's not acceptable. You know, I mean, it's great that we had a really good outcome. You know, what I'm trying to say, uh, and now I'm not sure why I was going for that. Not punchline, but that target of my friend telling me, oh, you, you know, you didn't notice. And I forget why. Because it's after midnight. <laughs> That's why. say I can say this that every experience is a learning experience and every experience is part of a bigger picture the bigger picture the big picture uh, and everything is interconnected and so when you look at any one thing in isolation you're not seeing it for what it is. But when you're frustrated when something happens, that's just what you see, and you see it in isolation. And I got pretty grumbly about it, you know? Uh, we, got, we, we got done because, you know, she, the singer eventually went to the tune she was supposed to, but I figured, okay, well, we took uh, way too long to get here, so I doubt we... She's planning to do the arrangement that we did with the extra modulation. So I came out of the tune, I think, earlier than she was going to, but I couldn't get a signal. But anyway, so it was just like, you know, the plane didn't crash when it landed, but it may have belly flopped a little bit, you know, required some maintenance thereafter. And I was just like, oh, get me off the freaking stage, you know. And, and it was a deal where, since the theater was sold out, for, for this. Performers were actually seated in the stage, but I made myself go backstage. That's where I stayed, you know. And as I'm going backstage, a m musician friend who's who's seen this side of me before, you know, just heard me sort of grumble, grumble, and I went, so I was a train wreck. <laughs> you know, then I have to catch myself and I have to say, you know, yay. Oh, yeah, another thing. In, in, in addition, there was a, a, a musician there, uh, that, you know, well known around here and other places, uh, local to the area, and he was a part of this, and we were both aware of each other. Me probably more aware of him than he of me, but you know, I don't know how that works, uh, and. So we had this nice conversation before about possibly collaborating. He's anxious to hear me play. Looking forward to hearing me play. I changed the word anxious. I, <laughs> no, no. He's, you know. And I was aware of that. See, that's another piece of this. See, this is what the post-game show is kind of about. Just bringing, it's not a show, obviously. But the post-game conversation is bringing this out. I'm making it a show. There's no business like post-game show business, right? Oh my goodness. Anyhow, uh, and I did not completely erase from my mind that what I was doing was making an impression one way or the other on this particular person. I wasn't doing anything differently. I wasn't, you know, showing off or anything, but, uh, it's like that being in my view did not help me not fall down when I couldn't remember the 
the chord changes for the tune at a certain point. Because if I had my wits about me, I would have gone gone to my procedure, and this is a completely different parenthesis, change the subject, but it's a mu musical thing. So, and this came up tonight in in in, in the gig, where the so serious musician you'll under you'll understand this that tunes have you know chord changes, they have you know chord progressions, and then you like figure them out, you remember what they are, you, 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 learn, you learn the chords. And there's kind of a, a memorization aspect to that, apart from the music. You know, so, so like, you don't have to play where you can be called this chord, this chord, and this chord here, and this chord here. And, you know, you understand, like, the sentence structure of all that. Uh, but, but for me, the labeling of that goes away when I play. And it's not even entirely there before I play, unless I make it be there. Like if I put a chord chart in front of me, I'm fine. I can follow it. But otherwise, my reference is the melody of a song. So let's just take Stardust, since that's what I played. Okay, let's take that much. Now, that melody... informs what the chord progression is. So chords are something, if you get down to the essence, because they're just basically harmony, organized harmony, that makes explicit the kind of movement, tension release-ish, that is, not ish, that is implicit makes explicit what's implicit in the melody. Now, if you really like listen to that and, and just feel it, there's there's this you know, ebb and flow, there's this well and contract. Right? That's like a bit so. So you have this, you have this tension supporting that, and you have, you have this, you know, nice little texture, but not tension. But for and musicians remember well that's in you know, F six and that's in F uh, F minor six or uh, two two five and E flat you know they, and they can recall that stuff and they can say that stuff it's all not in my head whatsoever but with the melody existing I can find it again of course I might find something not exactly the same but will work just as well and that can be an issue. So if I get lost, and I'm playing behind somebody, and they're singing, or there's a horn playing, and I'm not sure what to do, if I get lost, I will very softly play the melody, because that melody is going to inform me, oh, that gives me the other thing. And so I didn't have my wits about me. I didn't do that. You know? And, and that's something, it's not the best thing to do all the time. I try to do it discreetly, but if I'm getting a little lost, I find the melody, which even if I like miss it at first, like, where is it? Oh, it's over here. Then I'll find it. And as I'm playing the melody, the rest of the song, you know, structure is attaching itself to it. And I'm there again, which is, man, am I bouncing around. I hope you can follow me, which is an important part of learning uh, and teaching and practicing, especially if you're a musician, but whoever you are, that brain burp, sorry. That if you 
are completely in control of one specific aspect of something. And, th and this is, although I've been on this train for decades, so I didn't get it from Candy Warner. This is a big effortless mastery point, And I've recommended that book that he makes it slightly differently than I do, but same point that, you know, everything is connected to everything else. So if you have complete mastery of one thing, go to that thing, everything else attaches to it somehow. You know, I mean, everything else in the context of what it is you're doing and, you know, what ultimately is your lane and skill set and stuff. But you know, I'm trying to say... So that's my that's my way of doing it. Didn't have my wits about me. Didn't get it done. So, hmm. So am I going back to this last week in the gigs and saying, man, it's one frustrating experience after another? Because when turns out tonight was fun, but it was also frustrating because because I wasn't deep enough in the space or not in it at all some of the time, and the piano was ridiculous. I, and no, that's not what this weekend was. Because Sunday night. I had the uh, Jazz Vespers service with the McGeary Brothers uh, in, in, in Pittman. Oh my goodness. You know, the, these four gigs over the, the last few days are really like a, a real cross-section of what my experience is in the bigger picture, where I had like the, you know, gig in the trenches, which is what I'll call what I call things like tonight, we're just out there slugging it out, or as Max McShane would say, slinging the hash, you know? Uh, and then I had my thing on Saturday where I was, you know, involved with something in, 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 in the community, something kind of ancillary to, to, to what I do. And then on uh, Sunday, just digging back into my history, you know, nearly 50 years. Next year will be 50 years of my association with the Madeira Brothers. And we have uh, really, the three of us, just embraced, you know, just given a big giant bear hug to the original trio. And we want to put it out there and, and do some stuff next year in the 50th anniversary of our first meeting. Uh, and the post-game show analysis of Sunday night was the, the, the total radar, just the total camaraderie, you know. And it would have been nice to have video of it, you know, just, just to get all of our facial expressions, you, you know, because... All of us are catching everything that the other person is doing. You know, it was just, it was just absolutely wonderful. Uh, let's talk about that for a minute. So uh, I went to high school with these guys, uh, Jerome Paul Madiri, and I was 14. They were 16. Uh, they were two years older than me, one grade ahead of me. There was something that happened to them in first grade. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> uh, and that's when we formed our first little group. And they went to college a year before me. So they kind of like were kind of doing their own thing. And then I got there and we did our thing. But, you know, that was the start of lots of ebb and flows where I wouldn't see them for, you know, a long time. And then I work with them like, you know, 25 hours a day for, you know, weeks or months or even years. And then, for, you know, it would be like that. Um, so we got to, uh, I got to college. I caught up with them most of the year behind. And we met. Harry Salati that year. Uh, 
and the uh, tuba player, bass player, fine musician, and he was part of the Madiri uh, entourage for a long time before he went on to do do other things and teach school and you know go a more legit ish kind of you know normal route. Good for him. Uh, but his introduction of us, it was so sweet. He started with me, you know, because he's part of he's part of that church. He didn't play with us, but he was responsible for that jazz festival series and, and, and for booking us. All the stuff he had to say was just, you know, 50 years of doing this. And just like the the relationships, the rapports, the experience. What a blessing to be a musician. I think about this a lot uh, in the context of what is the motivation for doing this. The motivation for doing this is surrendering to what you're called to do, being that person that, that you are. And, you know, not necessarily doing it for success, monetary, you know, reward and, and all that, because all that kind of takes care of itself. Uh, and which is why this is going to seem like a detour, but this is what I've been thinking about, the context of it, that, you know, I've talked before about having trouble responding to people who, like, aren't convinced that I actually work. You know, it's like, well, what do you do? You play piano. So you have all this time. Go get a day, a, a, a day job because you don't work. Excuse me. You know, uh, I mean, from when I get up in the morning to when I go to bed at night, you know, with not a lot of exception. Occasionally, you know, I'll carve out a social thing or, or, or I might, you know, exercise while watching television for 45 minutes, you know but then go right back to what I'm doing, you know? And it's like, I realize I don't just need to justify what I'm doing. I need to just explain that when you do something like this, that you feel called to do, you're not, you're not dividing your life between what are you doing to make money? And then what are you doing for the rest of your life that you can enjoy with the money you make? And that's kind of the, the, the American way. And so, you know, you compartmentalize. You make your money and then you live it up or do the thing, you know, do, do, do the other things. Or maybe you just live your life and then as you're living it, figure out how to make the money you need in the process of doing it. You know, the, the, the approach is the, the, the other way around. Uh, and... The rewards are great, unless your main focus is money. If your main focus is money, don't go here. But, well, I was going to say, but, but don't be wanting, you know, what I have at this point. Uh, people, people will say, I wish I could do what you do. I would love to do this. And I say, no, you don't. No, you don't. Uh, and I'll come up with, uh, some, some reason why, you know, the, this is a ridiculous life. Well, one, one thing I'll say is, if you want to play like me, really? Do you understand that whatever goes on in my head that allows me to improvise like this continues to go on in my head when I walk away from the piano? It's like, you want to live with that, really? <laughs> but you know, when you are where you're supposed to be, you know you're, you, you, you know you're blessed. And you, because you're happy with your life. You're happy with your contribution. Whether there's a lot of money involved or, you know, enough money to get by involved. Right? And... <laughs> know what the future is going to bring. I'm not, you know, angling for, for, for a ton of money, but I'm be 63 soon. And who knows? Maybe, 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 maybe in my 60s, it'll be, you know, 
a different thing. But it, I'm gonna just keep living my, my life and doing my thing. But the uh, the blessings that this path has brought me, the life I get to lead, I'm very, very, very grateful for. Uh, and that can bring me to Friday's gig, right? Where uh, we had the concert with uh, with Sharon Sable, the the first in a series of uh, Blossom Deary theme shows that will support the release of our uh, new CD that actually isn't technically released yet, and it's not on the streaming platforms or anything like that, but it is uh, physically completed, and we have it. And so we made that a pre-release event and, off and offered CDs for sale. Uh, which we did very well with that, uh, by the way. And that was just a, a lovely, magical, magical evening. Uh, essentially sold out the show, and uh, it, it, it was great. And Sharon has been undergoing the evolution, because she's considerably you know, younger than I am, or... Yeah, she's younger than me, like a generation difference-ish. And, you know, she's always hung on to, you know, staying connected to another line of work, kind of as a fallback thing. And then she's been really, really longing for a long time to just just live her whole life for music. And, and financially, she can absolutely do it. And she's... But there's the fear thing, and she's finally letting go of that other thing, and she is just so happy, you know, and it's like, yeah, that's the blessed life. So she's grateful for her life, I'm grateful for my life. Now, if you're not on Facebook, okay, post-game show can go anywhere, right? Or the conversations about the gig. If you're not on Facebook, you didn't see this. If you are on Facebook, uh, this is probably going to be my uh, most reacted to post ever. It might already be. I'm not sure. Uh, but it kind of it, it exploded in my little corner of social media. <laughs> and it was the uh, sack strap saves the day <laughs> post. Uh, and, it, and even if you saw... You know, saw the post. I can elaborate a little more. This was funny. Uh, so, I'm uh, ready to go out. And we're being introduced. And I knew the order of the introductions uh, was going to be the two, like, side people, side men. But one was a woman, so I can't say side man. Uh, so, so, support people. And then me as sort of like the, you know, the, the, it was Sharon and I, but it was more about Sharon, but Sharon and I do these together. So I was introduced like, you know, part two and then part one, you know, and we're getting ready to in introduce me and I tighten my belt and it snaps, you know. And then I try to fix it again, and it snaps again. It's just that my belt is like, oh. And then, and then Sharon recalled, and she did it on mic the second set. She didn't do it the first set. But I just kind of got in a little bit of a panic. I go, oh, this is not good. Because what I realized later is I actually wore the wrong size pants. <laughs> uh, I have the two pair of pants. I used to be a lot heavier than I am now. And I've gotten rid of most of my heavy clothes, but I uh, I still have, I've saved some clothes that are a little bit bigger. Uh, and this particular pair of pants is two inches bigger at the waist. Okay, I didn't want to say what my waist is because I still could use, lose to use, lose to use, use to lose more. Uh, I'm a 40 waist. Uh, I was a lot more when I was heavy, but uh, I still have a few 42 pants, right? And I have the same pair of pants on the 40 and 42. And wasn't aware that I was wearing the 42. Which is okay. I just have to keep the belt tight. And so, right before I go up, okay, pants might come down. Let me tighten the belt. Snap. 
It's like, what am I going to do? I got to go, should go out holding your pants up. It's like, well, that's not a good look. And, oh, Mary Lou hadn't been introduced yet, her sax player. Because uh, she offered her, her strap, her sax strap. Yeah. And we got it in, and it was like the right size. It's like I had my sack strap belt. I mean, it was slightly loose, but it held my pants up. Uh, and I guess, you know, I didn't have the first set, the first set, I didn't, I had to go out there and I didn't dare stand up, right? And I had to stick my stomach out. Why am I, why am I telling you all this? I don't know. Uh, and Sharon didn't say anything the first set and I didn't move. You know how sometimes I'll stand up when I play? I don't often do it for the streams, but if you see me live, like none of that was happening. Uh, and then we go back in the intermission, and that's when Mary Lou, yeah, yeah, gave sang. Then, then I went back out, and then we made fun of fun with it, you know? It's just like, yeah, I wouldn't wear, dare stand up before, but I'm, when I do my solo piece, you're going to see me stand up like this. Look, I'm standing up! You know, yeah, kind of thing. But it was, it, it was, it was just funny. And I'm actually cons considering uh buying a sack strap or two you know because I, I should i keep a spare belt and i will now because my my bag my backpack that i take the gigs has all sorts of random things that i might need it's like back in the day with let's make a deal you know if i go with my my backpack and see monty hall i'll probably make a mint because i'll probably have whatever he's you know wanting to give you money for uh but it'd be fun to have a have a sack strap yeah, you know, and it's semi-fashionable. You can see the Facebook post. Uh, but you know, as as much as I couldn't get into the space tonight, and as much as I actually just fell down and went boom slightly uh, on Saturday night, uh, was how wonderfully connected Friday night was. And, and the circumstances were there, were there for that. And uh, it was just a, a, a wonderful experience. Uh, and what I used to do, this is going to be a big detour, but it makes me think of it. Before there was Facebook, uh, before I got on Facebook, which was 2009, I believe, uh, and I started kind of slow, but then I took off with it. Uh, I had my blog, my journal, uh, that you can link to from my website, but it's a standalone link, Joe Holtz Notes. No, wait a minute. Yeah, uh, joeholtznotes.blogspot.com. Right, there we go. It's a blogger site. And I started that in 2005. And that was kind of my social media thing. And I would make a lot of posts just about, you know, diary kind of ish things. And then I really struggled with it when Facebook came along because that's kind of what Facebook does. And it's a whole lot easier. You know, you just make this post and you stick it in there as opposed to trying to actually write a little essay about something and add a picture and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I kept the blog since 2005, but... Uh, there's been, you know, once Facebook came along, it got really sparse for a long time until I kind of figured out what to do with it. And I've sort of made it the place where I, you know, it, in the, the last decade or so, especially, where I, I'm more essay driven, you know, and I'm not giving the, uh, the diary kind of thing, but I also feel like I need to try to get more of that in because not everybody's on Facebook and the time's going to come maybe when fewer people are on Facebook. You know, and that's a whole other subject, the whole the whole social media, everything. Uh, so I'm going all over the place, but that's what the post-game show allows you to do. But oftentimes after a gig, I don't have the opportunity to do this. Uh... You know, I'm not connected with that band leader who years ago would call me every drive home and, and we talk through things. Uh, and occasionally, you know, you, you, you work with someone who is kind of into that concept, but, you, but usually not. Uh, 
and you just kind of like, you know, I, I'm not, don't have anybody else around to talk to it, to it with, talk to it with, talk about it with, yeah, talk to it. Hey, you, no, oh, not listening. It's late. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Yeah, but you know, I I made that phrase post game show, you know, for the for the occasional people that like 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 with Beth. I work with Beth, and and she's got it going for her. You want to do a post game? Post game call and talk about it, or 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 Sharon. I can do a post game. Let's do a post game. Yeah, that's that's a lot of fun. I already played Stardust. What should I play? Somebody who, you know, at this point I can begin to call a friend. I will meet this person soon. You know, I haven't actually met them yet. It's a, a social media thing. And this person is probably watching. And in fact, I know you are. And I won't say your name. Uh, but you paid me a very nice compliment. You know, like, is that, is that I have two qualities he admires in people that I allow myself to be vulnerable and I'm a lifelong learner. Well, thank you. So I'm going to be vulnerable right now. <laughs> and I'm going to play the tune and I should have been able to deal with that tune that the, the singer just started singing when she was supposed to be singing, I believe. You know, I believe that every drop that rain that falls, a flower grows, right? So she did the first tune, Love Letters. It was fine. And then I set up, I believe, and she starts singing, Let There Be Peace on Earth. And, you know, it's not a tune I typically play. And then there's one little spot where I'm not sure what happens, even if I think about it now. But I really should be able to get it. So let's see if I get it. And she did it in F. Let's see if, let's see if, if I screw it up.
That was certainly better than I did Friday night. Oh my goodness. So, one more thing I can point out based on just, just what happened there. That was actually a little nice demonstration of something. That the place where I really need to get to if I'm going to express the way that I am able to is where the hands start playing on their own. I often quote, if you've watched me with any regularity, you've heard me say this probably multiple times, what Keith Jarrett quote, that, to paraphrase it, when I sit at the piano, my hand knows what to do. If I try to tell it what to do, I'm stopping it. Not only am I stopping it, I'm stopping it from doing something better than I can think of. Uh, but you have to be in the right place for that. You have to be able to, 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 to receive it. And it's like peripheral vision. If you're looking at it, you don't see it. It comes at you from, from the side. Uh, yeah, somebody remind me, Joe. Remind yourself that you should try to build one of these uh, Wednesday evenings around peripheral vision. But did you notice, like, from the second time through, all of a sudden my left hand just kind of went, right? And that's what I'm going for. I got to get detached and then I can watch it happen and it's not thought driven it 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 knows where to go it's it's the way I would understand it right now and that's always going to evolve uh, it's my my intuitive connection to the larger thing that it's not accessed by comprehension. It's accessed by surrender to the connection to it. Which actually, and I typically don't get theological, but that would be how I would describe a connection with God. Uh, where in on the religious side, and I, you know, Christian in my case, uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a real emphasis put on you got to comprehend it properly. But where does the, even the comprehension come from? It's the it's the surrender to what can't be comprehended, the connection to what can't be comprehended, uh, and then from that, what is given to you to be able to be comprehend, comprehended comes. You know, it, it, it's like when I really understood some years ago, and I've talked about this, that music making is a spiritual discipline. One of the things that was you know, really clear to me is, in that process of seeing this clearly, that analysis is for after the fact. You know, and in jazz in particular, analysis is the path to something. And... Not really. I mean, you got to know your subject and you got to learn things. But, but the path to it is getting out of just being stuck in your head. And then the bigger thing can come out. And that's how it's always been with me. And I'm very grateful and blessed to understand now cleanly that I don't think my way to it. Because that used to be my problem. I would try to think my way to it. But, you know, sometimes you're just not in the place where that connection's working and you're just choosing not to think and then you're just kind of like, you're not playing a whole lot. Which is what happened to me a lot tonight. So it was fun to, fun to see that happen. It was limited. It wasn't a big flourish thing. But my left hand just started, you know, like, wow, look at, look, you know, good. What are you doing? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. That was fun. anything I can't tell you uh, oh yeah so what did Steve quote tonight uh, and, 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 I, and I made him laugh because he was like Santa Claus is coming to town he did just something that was just like and I just said real loud really and he appreciated that <laughs> so that's that's the topic the, the post game show just you know the the going over the gig the learning from the experience, 
figuring out, you know, what, what to do next time. And just really basking in the beauty of being able to live this life. So, <laughs> somebody can feed back to me if, 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 if you want. <laughs> uh, how this came across, I have no idea. Of course, now it's quarter after one in the morning instead of quarter after midnight. And although I do keep late hours, you know, you get to a certain point and absolutely by now and even several hours before where I wouldn't try to make a video because I'm not really sharp. Uh, but like I said, I have a little caffeine on the way home. This is water, by the way. The other was caffeine. So I made it. So thank you and hope to see you soon.